I started out working in restorative justice out of uh, the criminal law context where uh, I felt that uh, I had been teaching criminal law for about 25 years and was more part of the problem than the solution. Uh, and this kind of individualistic uh, response to punishment began to make uh, less and less sense to me. Meanwhile, I had been acting as a, a labor arbitrator since about 1984 and sitting in rooms listening to lawyers argue cases in front of me. And um, I, I just began to become more and more uncomfortable with my role as an arbitrator because it seemed to me that there had to be a better way to get at problems in the workplace than what I was being required to do. And um, at about the same time, well, a, a little while back, I never taught really uh, labor relations and stuff until later in my career, and I, I suddenly realized that um, as an arbitrator, I'd been working for about 20 years uh, in relation to a paradigm that no longer existed. Uh, and workplaces have changed and yet the way in which lawyers view workplaces has very often not changed. So I guess I'm interested in the, the kind of big institutional stuff and how it trickles down to what happens in individual kinds of problems in workplaces. So just let me talk for a couple of minutes about the way in which sort of workplaces have changed in ways that are sometimes hard to understand, but all of us, right? Almost all of us, none of us are coupon clippers, right? We all work for a living. Um, and our employment relationships are critical to our lives. The people that we interact with on a daily basis um, the way in which we work and how we relate is critical for our employers in terms of its productivity, profit in the private sector, capacity to compete. Uh, we've got, I think, restorative approaches become important for consumers and clients and even shareholders, um, and that um, restorative approaches can benefit all of these people in ways which are quite significant. But where have we come from? I'm a lawyer, right? Um, and we have something called the contract of employment. And the contract of employment is actually a kind of post-Second World War creation of the welfare state uh, and that we attach all sorts, or we used to, attach all sorts of benefits to the contract of employment. If you had a solid contract of employment, you had a pension, right? You had benefits. You had uh, ways to relate to people. If you were in a uh, unionized workplace, you had an advocate for you to help you solve problems. Well, that's all changing, right? The uh, vertically and horizontally integrated firm uh, is, a, is becoming a thing of the past. Uh, we're doing away with defined benefits pension plans because what's happening, uh, there's a guy named David Weil, an American from Boston, works at Harvard and Department of Justice has written a book, 2014, it's called The Fissured Workplace. And by what he means by that is the workplace is crumbling, it's being uh, divided into little bits and pieces. It's called The Fissured Workplace, Why Work Became So Bad for So Many and What to Do About It. And the workplace that he describes is international value chains where production has been fragmented around the world, or even in the domestic economies of the uh, advanced nations, we find that workplaces now, I mean, Marriott Hotels owns one hotel. 
the original hotel, which is their symbol that Mr. Marriott ran. The rest of them are all franchises. The people at the front desk don't work for the hotel. They work for a subcontracted company. The people who are doing up your room work for a separate company. The people who are doing the payroll work for a separate company. The people who are... Yeah, I think we still have people who are um, employed in this trade center. They're lucky in a certain way. So what that's created is this fragmented workplace where people don't relate adequately to one another and they can't even relate to the organization which maintains the brand, which retains your product loyalty to the brand, controlling every aspect of what goes on in the hotel except for labor relations. Regu labor relations are unregulated, which means there's a kind of competitive market with all those subcontractors who have an incentive not to uh, apply appropriate labor standards from the jurisdiction. So that's what I see as a kind of horrible big picture which has emerged, right? Um, and emerged in a, a legal environment which still sees sort of command and control as the way in which we deal with people. If people don't do the right thing, we suspend them, we punish them, or use capital punishment in the labor market, we fire them, right? It's a punitive model. Now, yes, I know, quality circles and, you know, uh, flat team-based management and sophisticated um, organizations and teachers and management schools talk about what might be thought to be a more restorative approach, but generally, our notion of disciplining employees is about proportional punishment, the same kind of thing which criminal lawyers argue about and judges impose. So I think we have to have a different approach. In 1919, the International Labor Organization was created and one of its mantras at the time was that labor is not just a commodity, that people are not slaves, and yet in a certain way we continue to treat labor as a commodity and treat people as, they're, as if they're slaves. I think that we have to change that. We have to change the values. I'm really... Um, partial to the work of Amartya Sen, labor uh, economist, who um, adopted or, or promoted a human capability approach to, to the way in which we think about economics, um, that we uh, have some sort of freedom where we have the choice um, to make choices that we have reason to value, in order to do that, we have to have political kinds of freedoms, economic facilities, social opportunities, rule of law, um, protective benefits in societies. There is a huge kind of relational um, uh, environment which enables freedom of a relational sort. I think that uh, Marcia Sen doesn't talk about relational autonomy the way our friend Jennifer Nad Nadelsky does, a law professor at the University of Toronto. But I think that that kind of relational understanding of the big structure ought to get find expression in relational rights rather than individual rights. And there are some sophisticated theorists of contract law who work in the area of relational rights that I can't talk to you about. Um, but relational values of equality and dignity and respect and mutual concern have to 
characterize our workplaces. So how do we do that? I think that there are sort of substantive policy preconditions which uh, can be brought to bear in terms of our thinking. I think that there are procedural opportunities and I think that we have to think about all of this, quite frankly, in an international context. Let me give you a couple of examples. I think that we have to prevent, we have to apply our legal policies to prevent people from um, using sham kinds of, uh, calling people independent contractors when they're not, they're just employees, and, you, and avoiding um, labor regulations in that kind of way. Um, you know, we, we should be treating volunteer interns who are trying to create relationships as people who ought to get paid. Uh, there are so many examples, right? And unionized workplaces, unions become a kind of hierarchical organizations very often whose relationship with their members is not healthy, it's not democratic, uh, and we have to take a restorative approach to internal um, understandings of um, labor kinds of contexts, but at least in a unionized context, context um, people who are members of unions have some protection and the, the employer knows that they have to deal with people on a, some sort of uh, intelligent basis the next day because the union is there. But in non-unionized workplaces, there are sophisticated theorists of, of management relations now in some management schools that are ta starting to apply restorative justice uh, in managing organizations, and I think that that can be quite um, helpful. And um, I think we should be using restorative conferencing rather than standard grievance arbitration in many contexts, particularly where there's a kind of poisoned workplace or where there's you know, uh, you know, bullying going on from the shop floor or from management, right? Uh, working across bargaining units, a technical North American kind of concept, restorative con conferencing can be useful. But there's a constant fear among government policy makers that if we have decent labor standards, we're going to not get investment, right? This kind of race to the bottom, which we have to transcend. And I think the Rana Plaza thing, which happened in Bangladesh, is a fascinating example where the International Labor Organization responded to what's called now consumocratic approaches to labor relations. And I think if Richard de Rible is right, that uh, by educating students to a restorative approach, the consumocratic kind of pressures to have good labor standards um, may bear fruit. Anyway, it's a big picture, little attempt to have some big kind of ideas, but values are critical in all this, and institutions, we can't solve the stuff just on the individual level. Thank you. Sorry to go over that.